I thought I'd read you a little of The Winds of Winter. Just a little. I don't have time to do a whole chapter here, but I'll, I'll read you the beginning of a, of a chapter. What a thrill. I just heard somebody say, I want to hear it, but I don't want to hear it. <laughs> now, if you, haven't read, uh, if you haven't read all the books up to and including A Dance with Dragons, you might want to leave, because uh, <laughs> this takes up right, right where The Dance with Dragons leaves off. It takes off of like, like five minutes after the end of A Dance with Dragons. So, uh, um, Brace yourselves. You're, you'll be right in the middle of it here. Victorian. The noble lady was a tub of a ship, as fat and wallowing as the noble ladies of the Greenlands. Her holds were huge, and Victorian packed them with armed men. With her would sail the other lesser prizes that the Iron Fleet had taken on its long voyage to Slaver's Bay, a lubbery assortment of cogs, great cogs, carracks, and trading galleys, salted here and there with fishing boats. It was a fleet both fat and feeble, promising much in the way of wool and wines and other trade goods, and little in the way of danger. Victorian gave the command of it to Wolf one ear. The slavers may shiver when they spy your sails rising from the sea, he told them, but once they see you plain, they will laugh at their fears. Traders and fishers, that's all you are. Any man can see that. Let them get close as they like, but keep your men hidden below ducks until you are ready. Then close and board them. Free the slaves and feed the slavers to the sea, but take the ships. We will have need of every hull to carry us back home. Home, Wolf grinned. The men will like the sound of that, Lord Captain. The ships first. Then we break these Junkishmen. Aye. The Iron Victory was lashed alongside the noble lady. The two ships bound tight with chains and grappling hooks. A ladder stretched between them. The great cog was much larger than the warship and sat higher in the water. All along the gun walls, the faces of the ironborn peered down, watching as Victorian clapped Wolf One Air on the shoulder and sent him clambering up the ladder. The sea was smooth and still, the sky bright with stars. Wolf ordered the ladder drawn up, the chains cast off. The warship and the cog parted ways. In the distance, the rest of Victorian's feigned fleet was raising sail. A ragged cheer went up from the crew of the Iron Victory and was answered in kind by the men of the noble lady. Victorian had given Wolf his best fighters. He envied them. They would be the first to strike a blow, the first to see that look of fear in the foeman's eyes. As he stood at the prow of the Iron Victory, watching one ear's merchant ships vanish one by one into the west, the faces of the first foe he'd ever slain came back to Victorian Greyjoy. He thought of his first ship, of his first woman. A restlessness was in him, a hunger for the dawn and the things this day would bring. Death or glory, I will drink my fill of both today. The sea stone chair should have been his when Balin died, but his brother Euron had stolen it from him, just as he had stolen his wife many years before. He stole her and he soiled her, but he left it for me to slay her. All that was done and gone now, though. Victorian would have his due at last. I have the horn, and soon I will have the woman, a woman lovelier than the wife he made me kill. Captain, the voice belonged to Longwater Pike. The oarsmen await your pleasure, three of them, and strong ones. Send them to my cabin. I want the priest as well. The oarsmen were all big. One was a boy, one a brute, one a bastard's bastard. The boy had been rowing for less than a year, the brute for twenty. They had names, but Victorian did not know them. One had come from Lamentation, one from Sparrowhawk, one from Spiderkiss. He could not be expected to know the names of every thrall who had ever pulled an oar in the Iron Fleet. Show them the horn, he commanded, when the three had been ushered into his cabin. Mokoro brought it forth, and the dusky woman lifted up a lantern to give them all a look. In the shifting lantern light, the hell horn seemed to writhe and turn in the priest's hands like a serpent fighting to escape. Makoro was a man of monstrous size, big-bellied, broad-shouldered, towering, but even in his grasp, the horn looked huge. My brother found this thing on Valeria, Victorian told the thralls. 
Think how big the dragon must have been to bear two of these upon his head. Bigger than Vagar or Meroxes. Bigger than Blarion, the Black Dread. He took the horn from Makoro and ran his palm along its curves. At the king's moot on Old Wick, one of Euron's mutes blew upon this horn. Some of you will remember. It was not a sound that any man who heard it will ever forget. They say he died, the boy said, him who blew the horn. Aye. The horn was smoking after. The mute had blisters on his lips, and the bird inked across his chest was bleeding. He died the next day. When they cut him open, his lungs were black. The horn is cursed, said the bastard's bastard. A dragon's horn from Valeria, said Victorian. Aye, it's cursed. I never said it wasn't. He brushed his hand across one of the red gold bands, and the ancient glyph seemed to sing beneath his fingertips. For half a heartbeat, he wanted nothing so much as to sound the horn himself. Euron was a fool to give me this. It is a precious thing and powerful. With this, I'll win the sea stone chair and then the iron throne. With this, I'll win the world. Claghorn blew the horn thrice and died for it. He was as big as any of you and strong as me. So strong that he could twist a man's head right off his shoulders with only his bare hands, and yet the horn killed him. It will kill us too, then, said the boy. Victorian did not oft forgive a thrall for talking out of turn, but the boy was young, no more than twenty, and soon to die besides. He let it pass. The mute sounded the horn three times. You three will sound it only once. Might be you'll die, might be you won't. All men die. The Iron Fleet is sailing into battle. Many on this very ship will be dead before the sun goes down, stabbed or slashed, gutted, drowned, burned alive. Only the gods know which of us will still be here come the morrow. Sound the horn and live, and I'll make free men of you, one or two or all three. I'll give you wives, a bit of land, a ship to sail, thralls of your own. Men will know your names. Even you, Lord Captain, asked the bastard's bastard. Aye. I'll do it then. And me, said the boy. The brute crossed his arms and nodded. If it made the three feel braver to believe they had a choice, let them cling to that. Victorian kid little what they believed. They were only thralls. You will sail with me on iron victory, he told them, but you will not join the battle. Boy, you're the youngest. You'll sound the horn first. When the time comes, you will blow it long and loud. They say you're strong. Blow the horn until you are too weak to stand, until the last bit of breath has been squeezed from you, until your lungs are burning. Let the freedmen hear you in Marine, the slavers in Yunkai, the ghosts in Astapur. Let the monkeys shit themselves at the sound when it rolls across the Isle of Cedars. Then pass the horn along to the next man. Do you hear me? Do you know what to do? The boy and the bastard bastards tug their forelocks. The brute might have done the same, but he was bold. You may touch the horn, then go. They left him one by one, the three thralls, and then Makoro. Victorian would not let him take the hell horn. I will keep it here with me until it's needed. As you command, would you have me bleed you? Victorian seized the dusky woman by the wrist and pulled her to him. She will do it. Go pray to your red god. Light your fire and tell me what you see. Makoro's dark eyes seem to shine. I see dragons. Wow. <laughs> Just a taste. Just a taste.